All right, Acts chapter 1, verse number 9. We're going to read 1 through 9 here. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. What was his passion? His passion was to go to the cross. His passion was to suffer for our sins. That was his passion. After his passion by many infallible proofs. All right, many. He was resurrected from the dead by many infallible proofs. We talked about that last week. The many infallible proofs of the resurrection. Not all of them. We, we didn't discuss all of them, but many of them we talked about. All right, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So he instructed them in the things of the kingdom of God. And they were hoping that he was going to get that started and kick it into gear right away. And that's not what he's going to tell them. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. The promise of the Holy Ghost coming to indwell them forever. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Soon it would come that that uh, the Holy Ghost would come, he would come, and then they would be endowed with power from on high. That's what would happen to them. So they're waiting for that. And he said unto them, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They wanted the kingdom restored right away. They wanted Christ to rule and reign on that throne, and Christ said, No, I'm going to rule and reign from heaven. But I'll come back one day, and I will. Because he tells them this, but, and he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. You and I can want God to do something and pray for God to do something, but it's up to God and his own power, his own wise counsel of when he does it or not. Right? We would like things to go smooth sometimes. We'd like, just like last night when we're evangelizing, we would like to see the power of God fall and those people get saved and get right with God. But it is God who chooses how he does his work and what, what he uses and, and how he uses it. And the times and the seasons are up to him, not up to us. We would like to see it, but it is up to the Lord. We can pray to that end and we can serve him, but the results are up to God. He will decide in his infinite wisdom and foreknowledge what will take place. And we have to, that has to suffice us. That has to be enough for us. We have to just continue to do what God has called us to do. We sow the seed and wait for God to give the increase. Amen? So that's important to understand. We talked about that as well. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. See, they, they had this they had this mindset of just right around them. They wanted the kingdom restored to Jerusalem. Hey, let's just get this going for Jerusalem. And, you know, they didn't think about the whole world that needed to be saved. Their focus was very small, right? And But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So he said that's what he was going to do with them, and then, he says this in verse number, or this is what happened in verse number nine. This is what we're going to cover today. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. So Jesus has been taken up in the clouds, and I want to talk to you about these clouds because they're very significant. I covered a little bit of this in a sermon a long time ago, but this is a little more extensive. What we're going to cover is a lot of scriptures that deal with that today. Uh, so let's pray. Father, Lord, please be with us now and help us, guide us, and direct us, Lord. Uh, help us to see what you want us to see in these texts, Lord, and to learn from them and speak and feed our hearts today with the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, we, what we have here in verse number 9 and 10, he had spoken these things while they beheld he was taken up, and a cloud received him. Those clouds are a sign, and I want to show you that because all through the scriptures, those clouds bear witness to divinity. They bear witness 
to the Godhead. They bear witness to Jehovah and his son. They bear witness to the power of the Holy Ghost. They bear witness to the Trinity. When you see those clouds, when the Bible talks about them and illustrates them, that is a sign of the Lord. That is the sign of God. And so we're going to go back and we're going to go to Exodus chapter 13. First of all, Exodus chapter 13 and verse number 20. And we're going to show this because this is very important because it has a lot to do with the coming of the Lord again, which a lot of people want to ignore this. They don't like this. They have it in their hearts that there's a pre-tribulation rapture, and it doesn't add up when you start to study the scriptures. When you study them, and believe me, I would love for it to be pre-trib, especially after last night. Because I personally think these children are going to kill us someday. Try anyway. But I would I would love to see that happen before. <laughs> the only problem is I don't have any Bible for it before. Because the Bible is very clear about these clouds and what takes place. It's another sign of his coming. And you have to learn to read those symbols in the scriptures and learn to see them in the context in which they're given in. Exodus chapter 13 and verse number 20. And they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud. So there is God leading them by, by day in a pillar of a cloud. God is there. It says, and the Lord went before them. That is a sign of God. That is a sign of God's movement, of God's presence. To lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. To go by day and night. God is the light. Jesus is the light of the world, right? Jesus is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, the Bible says. He is the true light, right? That is who Jesus Christ is. So he guides them. He took not away the pillar of of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night, from before the people. So there is one sign of that. Exodus 14, 19. We continue on. And I want you to remember here in this verse, in verse number 11, they said, which also said, you men of Galilee, in our text verse, you men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. How did they see him go into heaven? In the clouds, right? Remember that verse again. While they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Right? Exodus chapter 14, verse 19. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their faces and stood behind them. And it came, in verse number 24 says this, And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. God's going to do it again, too, when he comes back. Because how does he come back? In vengeance. Taking vengeance on them that know not God. In fiery vengeance, fiery indignation. With fire, he's going to come back. That's what he just said there, right? He smote the Egyptians with that, right? Same thing. With the pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. He troubled them. That's what's coming, right? Verse number 16, Exodus chapter, or yeah, Exodus chapter 19, verse number, or actually, let me back up, Exodus sixteen ten, And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. God's glory appeared in the cloud. Right? That's right. You know, understand this, Christian, that even though the clouds are in the sky and you don't see the sun shining, sometimes the sun is hidden behind the clouds, right? But God's face is still there. So no matter what trial you're going through in your life, the clouds are a sign that God is there and that he quickly will appear. Not as quickly as you would like it to be, but 
he will soon appear to give you that comfort that you need. But you have to look to the clouds and see that as a sign. So when the clouds and the storms and the tempest come and life is like that and the storm is raging, you've got to have faith because faith does not see with sight, but faith believes and faith knows. Faith knows even though it cannot feel. Do you understand that? Faith knows even though it cannot feel. You know, when, when you and I are going through the tempest and the storms and the clouds are there and the storm is raging, you know, after the clouds, you may still not see the sun right away, right? You may not see it right away. But one thing that you, after the storm is over, but one thing you do feel is the rays of the sun, even though the clouds are covering it. And you and I know the goodness of God and can still benefit from those rays that come from the sun, even though we don't see it very clearly. Amen? That's God's promise. That's a sign of what the Lord is doing. Exodus 16, 10, and it came to, oh, I read that one. Exodus 19, 9, and the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud. Isn't it amazing how God's always coming in that cloud? That's always a sign. Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. Why? Because they'll see that cloud and they're going to, I come in that thick cloud and they're going to know who that is. And believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. Verse number 16 of the same chapter. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount. And the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. So that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. He's going to shake this earth one more time. Exodus twenty four sixteen. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. The cloud covered it six days. The glory of the Lord. That's a sign of the glory of the Lord is when those clouds come like that. When the, uh, in the coming of the Lord, when he comes again, when God's presence is there, that's a sure sign of his presence and his coming. And may I remind you that the Bible speaks of his coming. It says before that, though, right, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. What does it say? Then shall you see coming in the clouds. That's what he said. Amen? Modern day theology doesn't like that. Most fundamentalist Christians don't like that. It's not something I separate with people over. I'm just saying I wish they could prove it. The pre-tribulation rapture. I wish they could prove that. Right? All right. It says here in Exodus 24, 16, And the glory of the Lord abode on Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. God's perfect number, that number seven of completion. So he waits six days after the six days on the seventh. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went in the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. What's that 40 days and 40 nights? The time of trial. 40 days of trial, 40 days of testing, 40 nights of testing, right? Mm -hmm. That's what that 40 is there. So we see that. Exodus 34, verse number 4. I figured after a long night I could keep you awake by you flipping through your Bible all the time. Right? Amen. <laughs> and he showed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tables of stone, and the Lord descended in the cloud. 
and stood with him there. Isn't that something? He stood with him there. Yeah, Jesus stood with him there. And proclaimed the name of the Lord. How about that? And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercies, mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Oh, stop there for a second. What you see last night? But they always start with that. God is love, and God is merciful, and God is... Yes, he is. What does it say here, though? It says here, forgiving iniquity and transgression, sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Not if you're guilty, he won't clear, he won't clear you unless you've been born again. Unless you've been forgiven. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. Did you not see that last night? Did you not see the iniquity of the fathers on the children? Only Jesus can break that curse. Only Jesus. That's why we're talking about this today. It was fitting. I didn't plan this initially. The Lord did. I wrote this a week ago. I put these notes together from the Pure Bible Word Search study program that I use from Pastor Hoggard. But it's very good, and I've heard him talk about it before. And I added some references and some things from my other study that I did a long time ago. I don't even remember what I did in that. I didn't even read all that. I don't even remember the whole thing. I didn't even go through that, really. But I added every reference that showed that the clouds and the sign of the Lord. I wanted to have that in there. Because we need to look at Jesus, today especially, after we've looked at the world all night, we need to look at Jesus. We need to see the glory of God. We need that for our spirits and our hearts. You know, the quickest way to encourage yourself in the Lord is to encourage yourself in the Lord. It's to look to him. It's to look to Jesus and stop looking at yourself. You know, you start thinking about that. You know what? You can do that. You can think about all the mistakes you made. You can go through there. Man, I did this last night. I wish I would have done that. I did this last night. I did this. Man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I would have done that differently. You can do that with your whole life, right? You can do all those things. And you can ask God for forgiveness, and then you can move on, and you can look to Jesus. And you can get your eyes on him. Because that will help your spirits. Amen? That will refresh you. That will strengthen you. That's what you need to do. Are you depressed? Are you discouraged? Are you down? Look to Jesus. Stop looking at yourself. Right? Look to Christ. I've already tried to tell you you're not much to look at. And when you continue to look at yourself, we always get discouraged. But why wouldn't we be discouraged when we look at ourselves? Fallen creatures that we are. Right? Feeble men that we are. Right? Right? We got feet aches and back aches, and some got ugly feet. And, right? Some of us are losing our hair, losing our teeth, <laughs> losing our chest. <laughs> right, Garrett? <laughs> Look for the lightning bolt. <laughs> right, Garrett? Right? Yeah, defeat. <laughs> Becca, we were going to buy you a big donut, but we forgot. We were going to buy you a big donut this big with feet like this. It was a big donut they made downtown. We were going to. It was called defeat. And we, in honor of Dave's snarly, gnarly, sorry, not snarly. <laughs> they probably do snarl, though. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I got to get going. <laughs> but. But when we start looking at all of our failures and everything that we are, uh, that's the direction we're going to go is down. But when we look up at Jesus, right, starts to encourage our spirits. Why? Because he's altogether lovely and better for us to look at and what we should be looking at. Amen? All right. 
says here, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children, under the third and to the fourth generation. Ooh. And Moses made haste. Why? Because he saw Jesus and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. Moses was interceding for the people because he didn't want he wanted God to go up in the midst of them. Right? He said he begged him to, he wanted God to go with him. Because he wanted the presence of God to be there with them. Amen? You and I ought to want that same thing. Exodus 40, verse number 34. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Amen. Isn't that what you and I desire? That the glory of the Lord would fill our hearts and our lives? That God would fill us with his glory and his power? Amen. There's a cloud that covered that tent. What is that? That cloud is a sign of the Lord. His presence. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, and they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. What does that tell you? It tells you that you and I should not move until we know that God is leading us. Amen. We should be very careful what we do and the decisions we make and make sure that we're making. Now, how do we know that? By making them biblically from the word of God. Right? And prayer and seeking good counsel for what we do. Amen? But we shouldn't move either until the cloud is lifted up, right? Until God shows us that. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse number 11. Moses said, and you came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire into the midst of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. I bet this was probably some of that thick darkness that could be felt. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Boy, that would be interesting. He did the same thing to Moses in the burning bush, right, when he was by himself. He spoke to Moses in the burning bush, and then with the people, he smoked out of that. He, he uh, spoke out of that pillar, right? And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude. What does that mean? Right? You didn't see any figure. God came to you in a cloud, but He did not show. A figure to you. Why? Because then you would be tempted to make it and to fall down and worship it. But saw no similitude, only you heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. That's the law of Mount Sinai, right? That's that law that brings fear, judgment, right? They were afraid. Well, should they be? Well, should every man be until he is saved, until he is not under the condemnation of the law? Leviticus chapter 16, verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place, within the veil, before the mercy seat which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in a cloud upon the mercy seat. Don't come into the cloud. Right? You're going to die. That's why no man can see God at any time, has seen God at any time, the Bible says. Moses saw his backside. He saw Jesus. Right? Mm Mm-hmm. Because God is holy, and we would burn up like the world is going to burn up in his presence when Jesus comes back again because of the glory of God. Amen? Numbers chapter 9, verse number 15. 
And on that day, and on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony. And at even there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. So it is always. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed. And in the place where the cloud abode, then the children of Israel pitched. You see the pattern there? At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed. And at the commandment of the Lord, they pitched. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle. I, I wish that we would obey God like that. God commanded it. Okay, so they did it. God commanded this, and they did it. We ought to be the same way. We should be the same way. Amen? It says here, whether by day or by night, the cloud was taken up, they journeyed, or whether it were two days or a month or a year. In verse number 22, that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle, remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tent and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed. At the commandment of the Lord, they rested in the tents, and at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord and the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So you notice this here. Maybe it was two days. Maybe it was a month. Maybe it was a year. Oh, we're not moving yet. But at a moment's notice, what was supposed to happen? They were to be up and ready to move. What does that tell us? That we ought to watch. That we ought to be watchful. Watch, therefore, to be alert, to be paying attention, to be sober-minded, to be paying attention to what's going on around us, to watch and to be alert for God when he wants to do something in our lives, when he's instructing us, when he is teaching us, when he is guiding us, when he is chastening us and trying to teach us something with his rod, that we are ready to listen, ready to hear, and ready to obey at a moment's notice. Right? What a lesson. Whether it is two days, a month, or a year. doesn't matter what it is. Not at all. Right? Numbers 11.25, And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him, and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. You find it interesting, there's 70 there. Do you remember when Jesus called his 70 and he put his spirit upon them? Showing himself that he is God, right? Isn't that right? Hang on one second here. I want to look at something. Wow, 70 is 61 times in the Bible. That's a lot. Let's see. It says, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also, and also sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whether him, he himself would come. Do you find that number interesting? I do. It's the same number, right? It's the same number that we see there. In the Old Testament there. So same pattern that is being showed. Right? Which is amazing. The Lord works in numbers. Amen? All right. So let's see. Oops, that's the wrong one. Let's see here. And somebody made that kid mad. Wasn't me. I didn't do it. it. Must have been somebody else. I have big kids cry like that. All right. So uh, let's see. Second Samuel chapter twenty-two, verse number ten. And he bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. You've heard this verse before. These verses they're in Psalms too. And he rode upon a cherub, and did fly, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind, and he made darkness pavilions round about him dark waters, and thick clouds of the skies. That's the Lord. That's the, the chariots of the Lord are what? Those cherubs, right? They're the chariots of the Lord, the Bible says. All right. Job chapter 22, verse number 14. Thick clouds are a covering to him. 
that he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. It's an interesting verse, isn't it? Next, the clouds are a sign of God's judgment. When God is getting ready to judge, you will see those clouds. Numbers 12, 5. We see a story here. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Came in no, he saw no similitude, but Moses did. Right? That's what he just said. Catch that? Those words mean something. Right? Similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore, then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Right? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. Look at this. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. She got in trouble. Why did she get in trouble? She spoke against the man of God. She spoke against him. She was very troubled after that, for that purpose, that reason. Because she spoke against God's providence. She said, well, you know, that's... And th- by the way, you would think that they would have learned from this woman when she did this. Because there was more of that that happened later. Korah. The rebellion of Korah. You take too much upon yourself, Moses. Seeing all the congregation is holy. God doesn't only just speak by you, Moses. Right? What's that? Yep, yep, that's right. The cloud departed from off the tabernacle. Behold, Miriam became leprous. And then, you know, of course the Lord healed her. But not right away. She spent a couple days like that. Was it a week? I can't remember. Was it? What's that, seven days? Yeah, seven days. Because he said if you're, if her father but spit in her face, then she'd be unclean for that amount of time. Right? Numbers 14, 14. What do we see here? What we see here back here um, is the clouds for judgment. Again, they are a sign of judgment. Acts chapter 1, verse 9 deals with that. That when they see Jesus again, he said, this is how he's going to come. Numbers 14, 14. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, for they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by day in a pillar of a cloud and a pillar of fire by night. Verse number 41 of the same chapter. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. So Korah had done his rebellion. Earth swallowed them up. That wasn't enough for him. They didn't learn their lesson yet. I understand that. Baptists are very stubborn people, too. Right? Takes us a while to learn our lesson. Right? All right, so here we go. Ye have killed the people of the Lord, and it came to pass, when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And right about there, it's going to get awful scary. Because there's going to be some judgment that comes with that. And God is going to act judgment upon them. That cloud is a sign of that judgment. When Jesus returns, that's a sign of judgment. That's what it is. It's a judgment of God. The Bible says it's after the tribulation of those days. Right? The sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. It's going to get a little crazy. Just a little bit. Pitch dark. Crazy. Not good. Pitch black. Not good. For them... 
Psalm 18, 9. The Bible says he bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. We just read this in, in 2 Samuel. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret pavilion. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and the thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. That fire also is the sign of his coming, right? What, what's going to happen to them? They're going to burn up, right? That's a fever that no Tylenol will take care of. When it comes, it's going to melt. Melt the earth with what? Fervent heat, right? Psalm 68, verse 32. Sing unto the Lord, ye kingdoms of the earth. O sing praises unto the Lord, Selah. To him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens, which were of old. Lo, he does send out his voice, and that a mighty voice. Ascribe ye strength unto God. His excellency is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. His strength is in the clouds. Why do you think he told them that when the cloud received them and took them up, took him up? Why do you think he said that to me? Shall so come in like manner as you see him go into heaven. This same Jesus, he's coming back again the same way he left. You're going to see him the same exact way. You're not going to see him a different way. That's what he said to him, right? That's what he said. People want to miss this on purpose, though. Oh, God, thou art terrible out of thy holy place, right? So he said, Psalm 97, 1, the Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Psalm 104, verse 3, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Right? The clouds, his chariot. Lamentations 2, 1. How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger. See that? The cloud is in his anger. It's a sign of his judgment. And cast down from heaven unto the earth the beauty of Israel. And remember not his footstool in the day of his anger. Lamentations chapter 2 verse 1. Lamentations three forty four. Thou hast covered thyself with the cloud that our prayer should not pass through. You ever felt that way? Yes, I have. Mm -hmm. But he's still there, and he still takes care of you. I'm going to explain that to you probably this week. Actually, next Sunday. Because I need some time to do it. I need about two messages at least to do it. I want to explain something to you that I believe some people experience, and they it's from the Bible, obviously, and that they, they don't understand. And you can confuse it very easily and misjudge it. So I'm going to help you with that and really explain it in detail next week. So um, anyway, but I understand what he means by that. Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud that our prayer should not pass through. Deuteronomy 5.22, these words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount, out of the midst of the fire of the cloud in the thick darkness, with a great voice, and he added no more, and he wrote them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. Right? In the midst of the fire and of the cloud, right there. Deuteronomy 31.14, and the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua and present yourself in the tabernacle of the congregation, that I might give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of a cloud. And the pillar of the cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. That's God's judgment. God was, Moses was going to die. He was going to send him to his death. 
and he passed that on. How about Solomon when he builds the house of the Lord? What happens there? In 1 Kings 8.10, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Solomon builds the temple. God rests his glory upon it at that time, but he took it away from him too. There's, there, there came a time when the glory had departed, right, from Solomon's temple. Because if it hadn't, there was no way anybody on this earth would have been able to destroy that temple. So then when Herod built his temple, you know, Jesus said destroy this temple, speaking of the temple of his body. But he said destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. Now that, my friend, is power. And they said, 40 and six years were we building this temple. Right? By the way, that number 46 is interesting too. Right, Brother Joshua? It's 23 and 23, right? Yeah. How about that? Isn't that interesting how that works? Yep, very interesting. Pastor Hogger has a good series on that. He talks about that a lot. A lot of different things. Okay, uh, let's see. Ezekiel 10.3. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house. When the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court, then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. Anybody seen a pattern here? <laughs> and the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. What does that sound like? It says out somewhere else, the voice of many waters. I don't even know what that means. The seven thunders, right? All I know is it is loud enough to wake the dead. Right? Thundering. Well, I know this, that when, when he spoke from heaven to Jesus in John chapter 7, 16, maybe 15, sorry. And he asked the Father to glorify. God spoke from heaven to him, right? And they heard thunder. But the children of God heard the voice of God. Right? Think about that. They heard thunder. I would say that was probably loud. You ever heard thunder so loud and lightning when it strikes? How loud it is? Yeah, how it just like booms so loud. Yep. It's going to be loud enough to wake the dead, right? Job 26, 9, he holdeth back the face of his throne and spreadeth his cloud upon it. Amen. Job went through a lot, and he got to learn a lot through those trials. No, him, Job, David, and Jesus, and there was probably others, those three men went through the most unique circumstances in all the scriptures. Lots of them. Psalms 105, verse 39. He spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light in the night. Isaiah 19, 1. The burden of Egypt, behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. And the idols of Egypt shall be moved out at his presence. And the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. That's going to happen again. Men's hearts failing them for fear. To fall on me. The rocks to fall on them, right? His cloud is also a sign of mercy, though. Isaiah 44, 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. And as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. That is God's call to his backslidden children. Not just those 
Israelites, but to the children of God today. Remember these, he says, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant, I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. What does that mean to be redeemed? It means to be purchased. It means to be bought and paid for with a price. Price, being bought out of the market. You're not for sale anymore. We see that in Hosea, right? Who he went and he bought Gomer. You shall no more go out. Right? Amen. That's the mercy of God right there, isn't it? Ezekiel chapter 1, verse number 26. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as of the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within. From the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire. It had brightness round about. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. I, Satan is a thief, right? Satan is a thief. And in Isaiah 14, 14, I just want you to notice this. He says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Why? Because that's the sign of God and his coming. So he wants to ascend. He says, I will ascend. Who's the one that ascended and was taken up into a cloud? What, is he, what did he say he's going to do? I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. See it? Now think about your opening verse here. I'm going to read it to you. And when he had spoken these things, when they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And when they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, gazing. Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. So he was taken up into a cloud, right? But Satan says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And next, his coming is in the clouds. His coming is in the clouds, and this is where we'll finish. Daniel chapter 7, verse number 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before me, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. But well, how's he come? One like the Son of Man. He came with the clouds of heaven. Sound a lot like Acts chapter 1, verse number 9, right? Yeah. And there was given unto him. So Nahum, how about Nahum chapter 1, verse number 3? The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. I don't know how I got that verse there, but it's a good one. <laughs> Good verse. Don't know why it's there. Matthew 17, 1. <laughs> I'll figure it out tomorrow when I'm sitting here. I'll, I'll figure it out tomorrow when I'm sitting here like, oh, that's why I did that. I forgot about that. Matthew 17, 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, 
and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto him, said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. While they yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Well, who's in the cloud? And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Who was in the cloud? God was in the cloud, and his voice came out. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid, just like you would be if a cloud came over you and started talking. Right? Amen. Same thing as in Mark chapter 9, verse number 2, the same Mark chapter or Luke chapter 9 speaks of eight days after these sayings. We won't go into all those verses because you've seen those before. Um, okay, so it says here in verse number 32, uh, Luke 9, 32, but Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias, not knowing what he had said, what he said. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them. So the same thing over and over again here we see in those three accounts of that. And, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. They entered into that cloud. Can you believe that? Yeah, you didn't see that in the other verse, did you? While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them. And they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And when this voice was passed, Jesus was found alone, and they kept it close and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. Well, he probably didn't think anybody believe him, right? Luke 21, 25, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. What's that? What are the powers of heaven? The principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, right? There's going to be a war. Well, there already is a war, but... It's going to get real serious at that time, right? It says here, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. What did he say? This is in Luke before he left. He said, well, long before he died, he said, hey. They're going to see this. This was when and when shall these things be? Right. Remember the three questions that are asked and the end of the world. Remember. And thy coming. Right. All there. All questions answered. Right. Let's see. Acts chapter one, verse number nine, which we're on now. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Well, how was that? He left in a cloud. He's coming in a cloud. He even said that before he left. He was very clear about that. Right? He said that to them when he was on this earth before he suffered. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse number 14. Find that one. <laughs> Zephaniah chapter 1, verse number 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath. A day of trouble and distress. A day of wasteness and desolation. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Well, that's pretty clear. 
isn't it? There's the clouds, right? Okay, there it is. Matthew 24, 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Oh, really? What sign is that? And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and glory. Well, he said it, right? Just so you didn't forget it, he said it again. In Matthew 26, 64, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. (laughs) He's on trial, right? He's on trial here. Jesus definitely had a way with words. He could make you think. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. What does that say to you? It says, O Israel, the next time you see your king, it will be coming in the clouds of heaven. Mark chapter 14, verse number 61. But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. By the way, just so you know, the high priest was not supposed to rent his clothes ever. He broke his own law, the law of Moses, by doing that. Wasn't supposed to rent his clothes. Oh, he rents his clothes there when he, when, because he was feigning a, a, uh, I've seen people do that. Well, not exactly that, but (laughs) I've seen him do a lot of things. And not really repent. First Thessalonians four seventeen. Isn't this interesting? Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Why in the clouds? Because Jesus is there. That's why. Because he's coming back in the cloud. Because he said he was. I mean, it's not going to be a secret? No. Not a secret. Then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Right? How about Revelation 1, 7, the last one? And then we're done. Revelation 1 7. Literally, right? <laughs> now and then literally one day. <laughs> right? Behold, he cometh with clouds. He does. It's what he said. It's what he's been trying to tell you all the way from Exodus <laughs> in the beginning. And all the way to Revelation. Right? Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Not a secret. And they also which pierced him. Israel. Right? And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. What does that mean? Do you know what that means? You've heard it before. You've heard these children do it, but... (laughs) Right? When they cry, really? (laughs) Anyway. They sound like it's a wail, anyway. Okay, to lament, to moan, to bewail, to weep, to express sorrow audibly. Loud weeping, violent lamentations. When a baby's hungry, that is a violent lamentation. (laughs) Like that. Sort of. But it'll be worse than that. Amen? 
By the way, that's interesting. That word whale is three times. Three times. And Ezekiel, son of man, wail for the multitude of Egypt and cast them down, even her and the daughters of the famous nations under the nether parts of the earth with them that go down into the pit. How about Micah 1.8? Therefore I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like the dragons and mourning as the owls. That's desolation. And then Revelation 1.7. See how that all fits together? Isn't that something? Almost like that was on purpose. I don't know. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. The clouds, that is a sign of his coming. That is a sign of his judgment. That is a sign of his working. It's a sign of his presence. Amen. So that's Acts chapter one, verse number nine. There's another part to that that I'd like to talk in verse number 10 about this same Jesus that we might cover sometime and deal a little bit more with that. But we'll see. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you've given us, Lord, your rich mercies to us. And Lord, we thank you that we can know from the scriptures. We can look through there. and We can see you, Lord. And we know you've showed us what you have planned for the future. You've showed us, Lord, what we need to know and hid from us the things that are not necessary for us to know that we should not be distracted with. Lord, help us to serve you. Help us to live for you. Help us to have a heart for you. Help us to go out and preach the gospel to these poor, dying, lost people out there, Lord, that are going to burn in hell because of their wickedness, that you're coming back again. And, oh, God, all the things that happened last night, Lord, we pray that it not be laid to their charge. Lord, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Please, God, be merciful unto them and save their souls. Lord, please bless the time we have together, the tracks this afternoon that it will be handed out, and bless the food to our bodies, we pray in Jesus' name.